Hello and welcome to St. Matthew Lutheran Church of Milwaukee. This is the service for February 4th, 2024, the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany of our Lord. We sing, Lord Jesus Christ, be present now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, God gracious, gracious Father, Father, I am sinful, sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, thoughts words, and actions. and actions. I have, I have not, not loved you with my whole heart. heart. I, I have, have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. 
Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, good will toward men. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you. We glorify you, we give thanks to you for your great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You take away the sin of the world. Receive our prayer. You sit at the right hand of God the Father. Have mercy on us. For you only are holy. You only are the Lord. You only, O oh Christ, with the Holy Spirit, are most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, keep your family continually in true faith so that those who rely only on the hope of your heavenly grace may be protected by your mighty power. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, beginning at verse 27. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing Psalm 103. Holy name, who 
forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles the lord is kind and merciful slow to anger and rich in The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is kind and merciful slow to anger and rich in compassion. The second reading is from Peter's first letter, chapter 5, beginning at verse 6. These verses are the text for the sermon, which has the theme, You Need Some Counseling. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We acclaim the gospel. St. Mark records the gospel in chapter 1, beginning at verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. 
So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We sing, I run to Christ. when chased by fear and find a refuge sure. Believe in me, his voice I hear, his words and wounds secure. I run to Christ when torn by grief and find abundant grace. I too had tears, he gently speaks, thus joy and sorrow meet. I run to Christ when worn by life, and find my soul refreshed. Come unto me, he calls through strife, fatigue gives way to rest. I run to Christ when vexed by hell, and find a mighty arm. The devil flees, the scriptures tell, he roars but cannot hide. I run to Christ when stalked by sin and find a sure escape. Deliver me, I cry to him, temptation yields to grace. I run to Christ when plagued by shame and find my one defense. I bore God's wrath, he pleads my case, my advocate and friend. Grace and peace are yours through the life and death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed in Christ Jesus, you have probably heard of interventions. Someone has a very serious problem. It's affecting their family, their work, other things, other people. Maybe a problem with alcohol, with drug addiction, a, a problem with anger management. So eventually some concerned friends, family, co-workers get together and they stage an intervention. 
some of us may have participated in an intervention as those doing the intervening or perhaps as the one who needed the intervention. Those interventions may come to kind of a head when the person is told clearly, you need some counseling. Similarly, that is the message from Peter's first letter today. We have all kinds of counsel in it, and God wouldn't put it in his word if we did not need it. And these verses remind us that we need some counseling about our pride and about our drinking. We know the obvious ways that pride shows up. The first things we might think of when we hear of being too proud, someone who is always bragging about their accomplishments or perhaps the accomplishments of, of their children, someone who perhaps is always showing off different possessions that they have, have purchased and they're so proud of those things. People who decide that other people don't measure up to them, so they are too arrogant to speak to those people. Maybe most of us, most of the time, can avoid those blatant sins of pride. But pride also shows up in less obvious forms in more subtle ways. When resentment comes along in our life, that's really a, a form of pride. Resenting something that we have to go through in life that we shouldn't have to go through. Resenting some sort of suffering. Maybe someone else should have to do this, but but I shouldn't have to do this. And right there with resentment can be jealousy. That person shouldn't have that. I should have that. And is that not pride? I should have it, not that person. And when we might resent what we have to go through in life, we need to think of our Savior's words. We need more counseling from him. When he spoke to his disciples at one point and said, when you're persecuted in one place, which he said will happen to his followers, flee to another. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. We who follow the teacher and master and savior who suffered and died for us should never be resentful about something we have to go through because of him. Pride shows up in complaining also. We heard that in our first reading where God rebuked and counseled Israel. Why do you complain, O Jacob? But our complaining can take the form of, I should not have to endure this. I deserve better. What is that but pride? Now, we could say we commit an aggravated sin of pride whenever we consider what's going on in the world at the moment. We know there are many active wars in this world right now with millions of people as war refugees. Millions of people who have lost their homes, who had to flee from violence and terror. Now, isn't then our sin of complaining about where we live or what we have an aggravated sin when we are well fed each day, when we're able to return to our own homes and sleep in our own beds, in climate-controlled comfort in almost all cases. 
Most dangerously, we can say, pride shows up when we become proud of our works, of the good things that God has enabled us to do, if indeed they are good things. And there is such a thing as godly pride, being pleasantly happy with God giving us the ability to do this or that thing that can also serve to give glory to him. But we have to be so careful because there can be a very short distance from that actual godly pride to the pride that begins to think that should count for something towards God accepting us. That should be part of the package that purchases heaven for us. Then we have some horrible, soul-destroying pride going on. God only accepts us through the perfectly humble sacrifice and works of his son, Jesus. And Paul writes to the Philippians about his humility. He was in very nature God, but he didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. But he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. In that letter also, God tells us what the opposite of pride is, what true humility is. He reminds us that each of us is to consider the other better than ourselves. Peter directs us to a way to demonstrate humility, to humble ourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. He tells us to cast all our anxiety on him because he cares for you. Because pride shows up when we are reluctant to pray. When we are thinking, no, I've, I've still got this. I don't have to resort to that desperate measure. God doesn't say to wait till some point of no return, some last ditch, maybe this will work thing with prayer. He wants us right away to cast all concerns and prayer on him. I can't remember which lumber yard it was that I was in once, but at the place where you place your orders and pick up your supplies, they had some cautionary pictures posted. They were of some ordinary minivans and in some places cars whose rooftops were crushed down to door level because they had a bunch of drywall or plywood strapped to the top of them. The warning was, your vehicle may not be equipped to carry this kind of a burden. It's going to end up simply destroying it. Our God is the opposite of that. He's built from eternity to take on all our burdens, all our anxieties, all our worries. He says, load it all on me. He wants us to demonstrate a humble faith in him by going to him in prayer, casting all our anxiety on him because he cares for us. We all need some counseling to continue to do that at all times. And we also need some counseling about our drinking. Now, when we hear that, of course, we first think, of alcohol. Maybe we especially think of that when we heard the reminder to be alert and be of sober mind. We hear sober and we naturally think of the, the sin of drunkenness and God addresses that in other places in Scripture, not abusing alcohol, not becoming intoxicated. We know how that impairs judgment and so on. But in this verse, he says, we are to have a sober mind. So this is not so much about avoiding the sin of our bodies becoming intoxicated with something. 
It's a caution about what our souls drink, what our souls take in. So even if the only alcohol we ever consume or plan to consume is the alcohol in the wine in Holy Communion, still we need counseling about our drinking about our drinking in of what the world offers us in its philosophies and influences. The world's philosophy will, of course, be often quite different, often the opposite of God's instruction and counseling. We need to go back to him again and again to hear the truth, to hear his uncorrupted will for us to live uncorrupted lives. If we drink too much of the world's judgment on moral matters, it will impair our judgment. We will not be sober-minded anymore. Just generally, this concept of being sober-minded of not letting our soul get intoxicated or impaired by the influences of this world. It's something that the Apostle Paul speaks about when he says to Timothy to keep your head, to keep a clear mind, to exercise self-control. Anything that leads us away from the healthy, sound, true judgment of God on how we are to live in this world, anything that leads us away from that is a danger to our soul. So we all need more counseling on avoiding those things. It's interesting how Peter speaks of the world here. So often in the Bible we are warned about the temptations of the world, about being drawn away from our Savior, by the, other, by the material treasures of this world. But this time when Peter speaks of the world, he encourages us to take a look at it, but not at its attractions and temptations. It seems that when Peter wrote this, a number of believers were experiencing some intense persecutions sometimes physical tortures and imprisonment, sometimes lighter persecution of confiscation of property and so on. Peter says, look around the world. He says, look around the world and see people standing firm in the faith. You know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing this same kind of suffering. We can look around our world right now. We can certainly look into church history and see the same things. We can see all kinds of Christian people going through all kinds of suffering and at times death because of their faith. We can see countries where even the ownership of Scripture is subject to severe punishment. We can see countries where they may let you be a Christian, but don't expect to go to any of the better schools, don't expect to be anywhere near the top of the waiting list for apartments. Look around the world, Peter instructs us, and realize all kinds of Christians are suffering in all kinds of ways. Don't drink in the world's philosophy that we are here for this time so that we can be comfortable and enjoy so many things of life. No, he reminds us there can be a price to be paid for our faith. You know, again, don't drink in the world's view on morality, on sexuality, on all kinds of things. In the world of alcohol intoxication, we know that sometimes that can begin 
to impair speech. Words get slurred. Drinking in too much of the world's philosophy may not end up in slurring our words, but it can end up, end up with us being more comfortable in swearing with our words. Drinking in the world's philosophies may not render us incapable of, of walking a straight line, that old sobriety test, but it can end up making it difficult for us to draw the line between what is right and wrong because drinking in the world's philosophy will announce to us, no, there really isn't such a thing as right or wrong. And it's up to each person to decide. And a person shouldn't ever be told they're wrong if they, they choose this or that. We need counseling about what we drink in. There is so much poison out there, but there is so much positive to counteract that. The positive message of Jesus Christ in the Word. In our psalm, we heard the promise that as far as the east is from the west, so far has God separated our transgressions from us. That was through the sacrifice of our Savior on the cross. We need to keep hearing that message, drinking it in, treasuring the sweet news of forgiveness. I hope I haven't too recently brought up the illustration of someone describing the struggle in him between the new creation that God made him in Jesus and the sinner that he was at birth. And he, just, he described it as two dogs within himself fighting each other, and he was asked, well, which dog is winning? And he answered, it's the one that I feed. We need counseling about our eating and drinking. What do we take in? Is it the message of God's Word that counsels, corrects, rebukes us, but also encourages us and uplifts us with the news of forgiveness in Christ? Feed the saint that God has made us. And be humble enough to admit we all need continued and constant counseling. Be careful with what we drink in of our culture. Be careful to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. The Holy Spirit is the counselor. He's the one who gave us faith in the first place. He's the one who will help keep us in the faith as that counselor keeps working with us through his word, through his sacrament, to bring us home to our Savior, the one who intervened into our world of death to give us eternal life. Amen. We join in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became a truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He, he will come, come again, again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Lord, the the giver of life, who who proceeds from from the the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has has spoken spoken through the prophets. We We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. church. We We acknowledge acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We We look look for the resurrection of the dead dead and and the the life of of the the world world to come. come. Amen. Amen. O Christ, who in great love kept your promise and came to give your life a ransom for sinners, look with patience on us and don't be quick to throw us aside. You are the searcher of our hearts and you know when we begin to turn away from you. We ask you to restore our sagging faith through the Holy Spirit. Do not judge us on account of our sins, for we must confess we daily sin much. But look upon us as your people, whom you have redeemed by your own blood. Forgive the lukewarmness that so often characterizes our faith. Forgive all acts by which we have abused your saving grace, as well as every instance of neglecting your word. Forgive us and correct whatever is wrong in us. To the praise and honor of your name, we ask it. Amen. Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive forgive us our trespasses trespasses as As we we forgive forgive those who trespass trespass against against us. And and lead lead us us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine thine is the kingdom and the the power and the glory forever and and ever. ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close with my faith looks up to thee.
his trust remove. Oh, bear me safe above a ransomed soul. We give thanks for this opportunity to hear of and praise our Lamb who took away our sins. Soon the season of Lent begins on Ash Wednesday, February 14th. Here at St. Matthew, we will have 4 o'clock and 6.30 services on the six Wednesdays of Lent. You're invited to attend and also to attend a, a supper in the time between those services. On Sunday mornings, we worship at 9. We regularly also have 6.30 Monday. We hope again that you can join us at 8444 West Melvina Street in Milwaukee. God be with you and yours until we meet again. <laughs>